post-directed therapy. I guess most of us will focus on um, vaccines, actually. And our first speaker is Maria Elena Potassi from the uh, Baylor in Texas. She's professor for pediatrics at the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. And her major interest is on helminths of different types, schisto hookworms, and on other neglected diseases, Chagas disease, Lishmania, and Jocerka, you name it, she works on it. And also now more recently went into this new group of so-called neglected diseases, namely um, SARS and MERS. And her major focus is on vaccines, and I won't spend more time. Please accept my apologies for that. I could no, okay. read a long list of achievements, but I think we want to listen to her talk first. Perfect, thank, thank you. you. Can everybody hear me with this? Perfect, excellent. Um, let me see where is that. Here it is. Well, thanks so much for this invitation. It's always a pleasure. And I'm going to try to give you a very broad talk about where we are with moving towards developing, developing vaccines, specifically for a cohort of neglected tropical diseases. Uh, and I'll use as a case study some of the um, data that we have in the process that we've used to advance the human hookworm vaccine initiative. Um, this slide. So first of all, who remembers the Millennium Development Goals? Everybody? Yes? So as you remember, there was the famous MDG6, which was very interesting in itself because, of course, it spoke about infectious diseases, it spoke about HIV, it spoke about TB, it spoke about malaria, and then it spoke about these other diseases. So these other diseases, actually, with the help of a few colleagues from the UK, with David Molyneux, with Alan Fennec, and with my boss, Peter Hotis, eventually we were able to coin these other diseases with the term of neglected tropical diseases. These diseases are, of course, not new. They're maybe in some areas of the world now re-emerging. But these have been diseases that have been afflicting a lot of people for many, many, many years, right? Hundreds of years. So who actually can tell me an example of a neglected tropical disease? Leishmania, OK. The yeah, there's, you know, so the WHO has these 17 so-called neglected diseases, but you can create your own list of neglected tropical diseases, right? You know, there's always the most neglected, neglected infectious disease, depending on what you work on. But I think the message that we want to uh, provide is when we work on these diseases, we all may have our own flavor of the month, or we all may want to be focusing on a specific disease. I think the key is that the, the success in advocating for the importance of these diseases and then the needs for developing new control tools is the fact that we now can talk about them in a concerted compendium format where we really can even evaluate their burden, their distribution, their the impact that they're having amongst the poorest populations in the world by kind of like trying to work with them together. So in this next list, I show you that, of course, one of the major issues that really uh, happens with these diseases is one, that um, they're neglected mostly, not necessarily because of that they're not afflicting a lot of people. As you can see, it afflicts you know, us, one of the 7 billion people in the whole world. That's a lot of people, right? Uh, there's a new. Um, study that we've been actually doing where there's, there was this perception that these NTDs only occur in poor countries, of course, in poor populations of poor countries. And slowly, with certainly globalization, with a lot of economic turmoil that we have had in the last decade, these NTDs are now actually also found in pockets of poverty, but amongst the richest countries of the world. And I, of course, come from the United States and living in Texas, sometimes we even think that Texas is the same as a, an underdeveloped country, right? Texas in itself. So the reason that we now see that these diseases are affecting so many poor people doesn't necessarily mean there are these dichotomy of just developing countries versus um, developed countries. So now we can find them all over the world, which is very important. And that opens up opportunities and certainly is attempting to then raise them out of this neglect, because now we can certainly have the justification of why 
why it is important to have control interventions developed because they're not really only affecting people that um, have no monetary economic power in this world, right? Um, so the, the, the topic of the to, uh, talk that I was asked to do is give you a little bit of a perspective of how vaccine development also can be integrated with what we call the current cornerstone of what currently happens in prevention for these, the majority of these entities, which is, of course is drug di drugs, right? You know, chemotherapy. And so we've known that, you know, for many, many years, and there's some really good examples of uh, programs that prevent these neglected diseases utilizing what we call either mass deworming administration. In some regions of the world, maybe it's not a community deworming, but it's also focused on school-age children. Now there's also programs that, affect, that really target preschool children. But the concept is that these um, mass deworming strategies are the ones who are um, theoretically going to be preventing the burden of these diseases. However, certainly, we know that they have lots of limitations, right? So a few limitations include the fact that drug uh, therapies um, don't necessarily prevent that you get reinfected. So what's happening is you can have cure, the population go back and live where they are continuously exposed by whether it's larvae or whether it's contaminated water, water with eggs, um, and you actually have reinfected. Infection rate. So we know that unless you do a very um, community broad uh, um, um, approach of uh, um, chemotherapy treatment, there's a lot of places that we are not achieving um, high rates of uh, protection by reducing, of course, the reinfection rates. And I'll give you some examples of that. Certainly, in the veterinary world, which of course all these neglected diseases tend to also be an issue of one health, you know, we see that um, there is also potential for uh, increasing resistance to these drugs. In humans, it has been a little bit of a controversy yet. There are some examples actually coming out of some studies from groups from Australia by looking at populations in PNG and other locations. In, uh, but clearly, we have to not wait until we actually see drug resistance to start developing alternative tools, right? So that, you know, we definitely have to remember that limitation. And certainly, is this whole concept of reach. And this is where I want to uh, show you is that if we were to look at the WHO goals, which usually are driven by the World Health Assembly resolutions, if you look at the uh, resolutions that are directed towards the amount of coverage that you need to have in order for you to achieve this potential uh, uh, cut of transmission of these diseases, we see that you know, in some, for some diseases, we're doing a relatively decent job, but clearly we're not really going to be able to achieve 100% of coverage. So who can give me a reason why you think we have so low coverages? Cost, you think? Why? I mean, in principle, a lot of these drugs are actually donated by big pharmaceutical companies. So in fact, the actual cost of the drug is practically null. And they basically, the distribution cost may cost, what, 50 cents, maybe a dollar. So, but why do, why do you think? I think it's because one of the issues could be regions of conflict. How do you reach the population if you have regions of conflict? So how many of you have actually heard this concept of Anthropocene? Have you? Yes? There? So what is the Anthropocene? Right, it's the Industrial Revolution where humans basically started, pardon my language, screwing up with the planet, right? 
That's why we now have the sustainable development goals that are actually a little bit more broader. And I think one of the reasons is we have globalization, people moving around. They're not static in a single location. We have had, of course, economic downturn. So you know, sometimes a country may have money to do these deworming strategies. Sometimes they don't have money. Uh, sometimes they, you, know, you have conflict and you cannot reach. You know, so there's a lot of variables. So we don't really have an actual answer. But the problem is, this is the reality. Maybe also that there's under under reporting, right? I mean, this is what you see in the WHO website. So you know, there's a lot of factors. That said, we certainly need to look for alternatives, right? But let me actually walk you through a couple of examples of where, in fact, some of these dewarming <laughs> strategies have had actually some really great successes. And we actually bucket the way that you do interventions or operational in, or research or interventions by, of course, using either mass deworming administration. You <coughs> certainly have to have some really good case detection or even vector control in some diseases, right? Uh, clearly, water sanitation is, you know, is very important. And of course, you have other approaches, right? So as examples, you know, with lymphatic filariasis, for example, we have had some really good successes, right? We basically reduced 52% of the cases between 2005 and 15. Um, certainly with trachoma, with ascaris, you know, you clearly, if you actually look at some of those um, targets from the, um, in, uh, certainly the WHO, you know, you hear that we are very close to controlling and even um, elimination for some of these targets. So great news, right? You know, clearly having had the Millennium Development Goals and having had, you know, initiatives which are spearheaded by certainly the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and others, we have had some great approaches for some diseases. The challenge, however, is that we also have had some very, pretty, you know, tremendous failures. And I think I want to highlight, because of course it's the diseases we're interested in, is that we've actually seen an increase in schistosomiasis. So even if with praziquantel, even with the attempt of using these deworming practices, we've actually seen an increase in the burden of schistosomiasis. For hookworm, we have had very minimal impact. And of course, for another helmet, trichuris, we've also seen some minimal impact. You know, clearly, <coughs> we are playing a little bit of a whack-a-mole game nowadays. You know, have you seen how much of these resurgence of these vector born type of uh, diseases, you know, West Nile virus, you know, Zika, you know, we have all sorts of, you know, so clearly vector-borne dengue, vector-borne diseases are important, and I think that's why nowadays you hear a lot about how do you do control, but not only looking at the pathogen, but also looking at the transmission of and the vector. Certainly, you've heard about the story, recent story of uh, uh, Ebola. You know, we are now interested again in this uh, uh, resurgence and reemergence of you know these respiratory viruses. Um, so clearly, we are losing the battle. So while we are really gaining in some areas, we are certainly losing it in another area. So the solution is. We need more research. We need more work. We need more tools. We, you know, the fantastic uh, talk from Tobias that he basically talked about systems biology. So we need alternative tools. That's you know certainly one of the things. <coughs> so what do we need? Of course, we need more implementation science. We need to really maximize the fact that we are still getting these donated drugs. So I don't know if you remember, uh, there was a time where together again with this group that are working on advancing NTD advocacy, they created what they call an impact package, which is instead of the schisto control going and deworm, and then the hookworm control goes in and deworm, they actually create an impact package where you actually go once and you give a package of medicines, which you're reducing the cost and you're maximizing the use. So there's huge data now that you're really accessing a lot of people and you're really having a good impact by providing this package of medicines. That said, again, we have that limitation that is not really showing that we're having the right reach and we're not really preventing reinfection. 
Certainly, we have those diseases that I mentioned that we call them the, the you know, that we are close to the end, make end game science, and certainly we can really probably reach elimination uh, for these diseases. But the important, I think, is to highlight, you know, we never have to stop, you know, with new research, with new drugs, new diagnostic, new vaccines, and certainly um, also the fact that not only is, is important for us to do science in our labs, how do you really engage the policy makers? How do you really do communication engagement and science engagement? <laughs> you know, how many of you know about the story of the hepatitis B uh, vaccine, right? How many years did it take after it was licensed in countries like the US to actually reach countries like Honduras, for example. It took forever because there was really no advocacy, no preparation for these countries to really learn why do you need to integrate these new control strategies within their you know, health policies. So then, however, you know, we have to be mindful of the fact that we all cannot be everything for everything, right? So I cannot be working on everything to try to prevent, treat, or control, or diagnose ne all the neglected tropical diseases. But we have to remember that you know, we should try to strive to working with this concept of integration, that we have to work in collaboration, that we have to be working in partnerships. And I think that's why I really enjoyed meeting you know, some of the colleagues yesterday from this uh, vaccine uh, uh, master program because it really shows you how you can bring groups from Barcelona and groups from you know uh, um, uh, Belgium and of course France and hopefully even you know a few of us from the US that we can actually advance this so let me now then uh, shift very quickly to tell you a little bit of therefore how do we go by developing vaccines for these very complex parasites and certainly some of you here are experts experts, you know, TB is very complex, but can you imagine developing a vaccine for an organism that beyond being the fact that it's an actual animal, right, it's a, it's a sometimes even visible animal, the complexity of having multiple stages, the complexity of even having probably even multiple uh, reservoirs and vectors, you know, how do you go from, you know, doing all the basic science, the discovery of what are the potential candidates and transition them into something that actually is a, it's an actual vial of a vaccine. And then we go into that whole concept of how do you do clinical development, but eventually the most important is how do you get them to actually reach the community. So I'm going to use a paper that actually was written a few years ago, which is what we call this whole concept of translational development, right? How do you actually do? It's a thought process, which unfortunately you, you, you have to do a lot of um, thinking and maybe even writing it and preparing what we call this whole concept of a target product profile. How many of you have heard that concept, that term, target product profile? What is it, right? A lot of you have, right? Which is basically is the indication. Who is it going to be for? What's your target population? What's going to be the dosage? So there's a lot of information that you need to already know, even though you haven't even started doing your research, right? So we go through this concept of, you know, usually, usually you first have to answer a few questions. Because why do you even need to develop a vaccine, let's say, for hookworm? I mean, of course, we do know that we have a public health need. We know that there's a very significant burden of the disease. But what's kind of the, de the development model that we're going to use? I mean, remember, there's nobody running to give you funding millions of dollars to develop a hookworm vaccine, right? So we had to come up with a concept, a business model that relies, again, on this product development partnership approaches where you utilize academic institutions that have their expertise and know-how with joining forces with with governmental agencies, with countries, with uh, ideally pharmaceutical or biotech companies. So come up with a strategy that each of us can put in a piece of, the, of, the, of, of how you do it until you start moving targets from the bench all the way to the yeah. clinic. But then most importantly is, of course, going through the whole concept of, which you students have probably already seen, what is the continuum of vaccine development, right? Which I can uh, show it to you here. It's complex, 
you have to have a lot of patience, and ideally you have to have a lot of money too, right? Um, so we, we are ready for neglected tropical disease vaccine development. Most likely are starting as a, at a disadvantage because one of the ideals is that you start with a lot of targets because of course you only want one to work but if you don't have a lot of targets to start with the likelihood of failure is probably higher right so that's i think one of the biggest challenges that we have in our field and that's why i think systems biology and these new ways of uh, target identification and candidate selection is very important i mean unfortunately when we started working we were basically doing immune screenings right you get a hyperimmune sera you screen libraries and see whether something comes out, but then you barely have money to even bring one molecule to the next step. And then, you, and then it's luck, right? A lot of luck. So ideally, and this is why drug development tends to be a little bit more interesting and faster, because you can do a lot of in silico lead candidate selections. With vaccines, you still rely a lot on, on, on real preclinical animal data to show that a candidate actually works. So arguably, you know, it's hard. Then, of course, you have to go through the entire production process, manufacturing. You know, it, it's very costly for you to make a decision to go from a candidate, to go from the bench, to scale it, to manufacture it. A manufacturing cost, you know, a million bucks. A toxicology costs another million bucks, and you barely have a million bucks for doing your research. So, but I think it's doable. You know, you just have to be uh, very uh, conscious of the type of uh, decisions that you make. So for example, one uh, our product development partnership, so it, our group is in Houston, Texas. We moved from the George Washington University seven years ago where we started this uh, program of developing the vaccines. Um, so we now have around 17, 18 years of track record. We're probably one of the PDPs, uh, the only PDPs that is really embedded in an academic health center. And we specialize on recombinant protein technologies, specifically for multiple neglected tropical diseases. And we really try to really bridge that valley of death gap, right? Bringing those molecules from the bench to the point where at least we get them into first in human studies and ideally beyond and going towards the licensure stages. So we have been successful for um, human hookworm. Uh, this is probably the most advanced of our programs. After this one, I have a couple of slides from our schistosomiasis program. So let me very quickly walk you through of what we're doing. Um, so first of all, we know that by doing some um, cost economic modeling and some, some, some modeling studies that if we were to integrate drug treatment to, with vaccination, we believe we can have a better impact. Why do I say this? So if you go take a population and you deworm them, and ideally you get rid of any um, ongoing infection, I, you would probably allow this population to restore themselves immunologically to the point where you actually can, with vaccination, ideally induce some sort of protective immunity for when they actually uh, go back into reinfection. So of course, until you don't do this and you don't prove it, we know we don't we don't know. Um, so we have uh, basically um, targeted the blood feeding mechanism of the worm in a point where, for the worm to be able to survive, we uh, know that it uh, feeds in with hemoglobin. So if we disrupt the ability of the worm to either degrade the hemoglobin or to detoxify the heme after the degradation of hemoglobin, and that we do it through an aspartic protease and a glutathione S transferase. We have, based on a lot of preclinical data, have seen that the worms actually starve to death. The fecundity of the female reduces drastically, and so you actually have less eggs in the feces. And so ideally, you would eventually even interrupt transmission with this approach. So very briefly, um, we have developed the aspartic protease vaccine. Uh, 
concomitant, we developed a glutathione uh, S transferase vaccine. You develop them as single immunogen separately. And now, what we have been doing for the last 10 years is a compendium of phase one studies, both in the US, in Brazil, as well as in Africa, to the point where now we're doing actually co administration trials. So, in this, uh, I'm going to slip to this slide and then come back to this. So, in this slide, you can see a very complex a clinical development plan where we first have to evaluate each vaccine with various formulations, various adjuvants, uh, both in all in adults to the point where now finally, after you know you were hearing again the prior, prior talk, we're now finally de-escalating in children and we're seeing the safety and immunogenicity in children and we're doing it now as a co-administration study. So you always have to evaluate vaccines individually and then we put them together. Together. Now, I'm going to go back one slide, if I can, yes, with this, um, because the question that we're having is, so now that we have all the safety data, how are we going to be able to prove that we have efficacy? And by doing these studies in the field, it's going to probably take us a long time to wait until you deworm, you vaccinate, and then leave the population to naturally reinfect themselves. There's a lot of variability. So we're actually developing a control human challenge model so that we ourselves can basically infect the population in the lab. And it's quite advanced. Of course, we're using a lot of data coming out of the malaria and the dengue and all sorts of people who have uh, these types of control challenge models. And so we now actually can use this as a tool to measure the efficacy of our vaccines. And that's what we're doing right now. So one of our uh, studies, in fact, is going to be um, basically challenging the population to see if we actually can see a readout of efficacy and proof of concept. So we're really excited. We just started this study. Um, we're doing it in the US uh, where we can you know, you know, take naive population. Basically, we have donors that we can collect the, the larvae, and then we use these larvae to infect um, after we vaccinated a population. Um, so, and then the, uh, the second story, which is the schistosomiasis vaccine, again, this is quite interesting. It's very unique in itself because we're also working with a group in Australia where we're focusing on our vaccine candidates on the tetraspanings, which are kind of the tegument molecules of the schistosome. We're also quite advanced with this uh, vaccine where um, we are using the extracellular loop of one of these tetraspanings. Uh, we just finished the first in human study in the United States and with the NIH they just gave us an award to start uh, in an endemic population to see safety and immunogenicity. So I'm going to end by just reminding everyone there that the research that we do, even though we may start with the basic research in the laboratory, it is always important to try to always remember where it is that we are heading towards and especially design the experiments in a way that we're trying to start moving the concepts of bringing these discoveries all the way to the clinic. And until we don't actually reach the clinic in our case, we we will not really be able to identify what are these protective mechanisms, you know, what are these immunologic protective mechanisms. And I'm going to stop there by thanking, of course, all our sponsors that give us uh, money to advance this, and I'm you know, open for questions. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Two questions. Thank you so much for yeah. also keeping in time. Questions? Down there, up there. <laughs> Go here. That's better. Twenty-five years ago, I participated to the, uh, the development of a vaccine for schistosomiasis that led to the first clinical trial in Senegal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then nothing happened. So why is there something like that? Stop. Then oh, we go, go back on and then stop again. Then back.
how can we be still have hope? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, certainly the one that you're speaking to is the, the, uh, was against Japonicon, right? And it actually used the GST, the GST molecule the for schisto. Mm -hmm. Is that the Andre Capron yeah, stuff? Andre Capron, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I can speak for that work, uh, of course. Um, I mean, we've been trying to work on this also for the last decade. Um, I think the challenge is, is likely it's money, right? I mean, that's always a challenge. So you do you advance as fast as you can, as much as you get money. And as you go more and more deep into these clinical development programs, they're very expensive programs. I think our approach has been that we publish even if we get negative data. I mean, you know, for example, with one of our hookworm molecules that we had to basically stop the clinical trials is because we were using larval, um, uh, a candidate that was uh, obtained from the larval stage of the worm, and we realize that those um, molecules already are um, very well seen by the, the host, and they were some pre-existing IgE, and we actually had a high proallergenic reactions against it. So of course, then you stop that, and you then go back to the drawing board, and that's how we then kind of like started analyzing, can we look at a different mechanism using this whole uh, anti-feeding mechanism. Uh, but until you don't try it and then you go backwards and then you go a step forward but you know I think that we should not get, get discouraged and continue working on it. Okay. Thank you. One more question. How do you do the antigen discovery for these so again, so the just repeat the question to be sure. So how do we do the antigen discovery? So as I mentioned, the traditional way has been um, we take the the animal model. So this hookworm, we also have uh, can, uh, the caninum, which is the one that affects dogs. We have a, a strain which is selenicum that affects hamsters. So what we do is we either irradiate larvae, and we then hyper, you know, create a hyperimmune sera, and then we do, you know, basically screening of the larvae. So that's one example. Nowadays, we're doing transcriptome. We're, of course, doing libraries like with signal peptide proteomics. Um, now we do a little bit of what we call, re call reverse vaccinology in the context of how much reverse vaccinology you can do with these parasites, right? Um, so we're starting to look at a little bit more uh, innovative ways to doing the discovery. These antigens were identified through the old methods. One very short last question from Mark. We're running short. Yes, so you described your, your public private initiative regarding the hookworm, hookworm vaccine. So at this stage, so you are uh, assessing the preliminary efficacy of your vaccine, but who will cover the cost of the whole development and the most co costly part of right, this? Right, which is post so, phase two. <laughs> so you think that at this stage, uh, 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 private private company can support this? Is there a, a business model that would justify this? Yeah. Or do you think that you need public-private partnership throughout the process? Right. Uh, very good question. And I think that's, of course, one of the greatest challenges. So we have been, indeed, continuously approaching the big pharma, uh, the, in, even, for example, the Indian vaccine manufacturers or the developing country vaccine manufacturers. We have a business uh, uh, case model. We've even done uh, a lot of um, economic studies to, uh, you know, to even have an assessment of the cost of the vaccine, the, 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 what are the, the countries, the first entry market countries, um, you know, the, the revenue that you would get because even even though you may sell this at a dollar, right, a dose, you know, or 45 cents, whatever it is, eventually with long term, as you do cohort vaccination, you may recoup some of the revenue. What we're definitely doing is delinking as much as we can the development, meaning if we can use grant funding or um, agency funding that will, doesn't have to be recouped, then whoever takes on the industrial manufacturing or even the licensure, you know, going towards licensure, they would really only have to focus on the really advanced process, right, which is already a lot of money. Um, we, we have good discussions, you know, you, you speak to GSK or you speak to, you know, Merck or anyone, they, all of them are interested, but they will really want to see the proof of concept first.
Good. And so we have to work on Not good, course. but that's, um, thank you. We have to go on. But that's how life is, that's actually. I went to you. Thank you. <laughs>